Good afternoon, welcome to Compass Wednesday, today with uh, Professor Alex Solovyev from Nova Southeastern University, where he has been since 1996, and we have seen him here uh, several more times giving seminars be before the COVID time, I think, not so many times after COVID. So it's good to have you back. Uh, so he is in the Department of Marine and Environmental Sciences at the Heimos College of Arts and Sciences in Dania Beach, uh, right? And he's the leader of the physics uh, of the physical oceanography lab. And a little uh, history here: he grew up in Ukraine, and he has his uh, Ukraine uh, flag on the shirt today. <laughs> he got an engineering degree in uh, thermo, uh, thermodynamics and hydromechanics of the ocean uh, from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology in 1976. Then a, a doctor degree and a, so a PhD and a doctor of science degree, which is like, a, like the habilitation in Germany, the teaching uh, qualification uh, from the... Uh, uh, Soviet Academy of Sciences in 1979 and 1992, respectively. He spent some time at the Shershov Institute of Oceanology and the Obukov Institute of Atmospheric Physics of the Academy of Science of the Soviet Union. And then he was a visiting scientist at the University of Hawaii. He was a visiting scientist at the University of Hamburg. Then he came here to Nova Southeastern University. Now he is a US citizen. Um, he has participated in several major experiments. He has more than 75 peer-reviewed publications. He has four patents, and he has even written a book called The Near Surface Layer of the Ocean, Structure, Dynamics, and Applications, published by Springer in 2006 and again in 2014. And he will talk today about physical oceanographic aspects of upwelling events on the southeast Florida shelf. Yeah, thank you, Professor Weiser, for a nice uh, introduction. I'm happy again uh, be after how many years, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, everything was online. It was not necessary to come in person. So I'll be talking uh, today <coughs> about uh, physical oceanographic aspects uh, of uh, upwelling events on the southeast uh, Florida shelf. Uh, and uh, my courses are Alfredo Cuisada. He is... Uh, used to be master degree students, but one month ago he became master. And uh, Megan uh, Miller, also a master degree student at our lab, she also defended recently. I will be using some of uh, their materials in this uh, presentation. And then, uh, careful, Bernhard Regel and Richard Deutsch, two renowned specialists uh, in coral reef science. And this will be uh, about coral science, actually. Uh, uh, co coral reef benthic communities uh, are sensitive to changes uh, in uh, environmental parameters uh, such as temperature, <coughs> nutrient supply, and uh, physical oceanography processes that induce the coastal ocean upwelling uh, seems to be quite uh, important uh, for coral reef uh, uh, communities. And uh, physical oceanography parameters uh, in general drive uh, community structure of tropical reef. Uh, my belief of not coral reef uh, specialists that uh, there is some convenient, comfortable range for corals, uh, uh, more than 16 centigrade and probably less than maybe 28 or something like that, when they survive most of them. But if they go out uh, either warm temperature water, uh, they bleach or they go, as we see now, uh, into upwelling event, uh, they also die even more uh, from bleaching. On the left side, uh, left side, you can see here uh, one example of observation uh, of uh, a strong upwelling event uh, on southeast uh, Florida. Uh, this was in uh, January 2010, published by Lerman and the colleagues in 2000. Uh, 11, and uh, this graph uh, uh, shows uh, four locations, uh, uh, Biscayne, Upper 
keys, uh, middle keys and uh, lower keys and it has temperature by different colors uh, uh, offshore temperature that is red mid shelf uh, is it uh, light blue and uh, yeah, in short that's dark blue and what is here also uh, is gray boxes uh, and uh, they are showing the range when corals may not survive that is temperatures below 16 uh, centigrade and in some cases uh, there were uh, actually no cases in this uh, situation temperature dropped uh, in the inner sh inner sh inshore and in some cases even in uh, mid shore and that was only for f several days but the corals uh, death was more than 10 percent just for a few days this is uh, much much bigger than when it's uh, warming water bleaching which in these locations, according to this publication, 2011, it's only about half percent maximum, but there were 10 and half or something like that, so 20 times, 20 times bigger. So, upwellings, uh, sounds play a very important role on the southeast of Florida shelf, uh, and been observations, mostly by divers who go dive and say, oh my gosh, so cold here, <laughs> what's going on? We're not supposed to have upwellings here. This is east, western boundary current. We are not on the eastern boundary. We are not in California. We are not in Canary Valley. Uh, so what's going on here, actually? Interesting to try to understand. Uh, unfortunately, not much is known. Uh, I remember that at the Novo Oceanographic Center, there were uh, several uh, meetings, maybe 10 years, 15 years ago, trying to understand what are wellings. And some people who were divers from uh, Jupiter, for example, they're saying, yeah, we do have it. <laughs> but why? It's a western boundary current, uh, not supposed to be. Um, so we're trying to understand really what is the situation. So I'll uh, uh, stop here on three cases. First, uh, hurricane-induced upwelling. Uh, second, upwelling produced by breaking internal waste soliton. And uh, upwelling produced by an undercurrent jet. I'll explain a little bit later what is undercurrent uh, jet. Uh, there are, of course, should be some other possible cases of upwelling, like um, I heard meandering of the Gulf Stream, of the uh, yeah, Florida current Gulf Stream may cause them, but that's not uh, ever proven, even maybe some unknown, which we still don't know. Let's uh, first uh, start uh, from hurricanes. Yeah, of course, you know. Florida, what is hurricanes, but it appears that they produced upwellings in some situation, not in every, but should be some special orientation and track of the hurricane. I'd uh, like just uh, to remain a couple of slides. It's uh, from my physical oceanography class, so sorry. <laughs> just to be sure we are on uh, the same page. So upwellings, uh, wind induced, uh, I say, traditional upwellings uh, occur when we have uh, wind uh, going along the shore and if it, we are in the northern hemisphere that uh, should be sh shore line should be on the left side and then because of Coriolis uh, acne transport is perpendicular and the moving water away when it's moving water away it must be replaced by something and they can replace only from below you cannot do it anywhere that's how first uh, sea level drop happens like in California there is quite big maybe feet, feet or two sometimes and uh, water is another now coming from below and this water is cold it contains nutrients uh, how good it for uh, local biological community especially for corals that's a good point uh, then situation here that again as i mentioned we are western boundary current and stormwell maybe 75 years ago showed that uh, in the uh, Western boundary current analyzing vorticity. Well, the vorticity change is related to this balance by friction, wind stress, and important. That's where we are. Wind stress should be unimportant. In eastern boundary current, vorticity change is related to this balance by the wind induced vorticity. Friction is an important. And one important uh, consequence here, since winds are important on the eastern boundary and are not on the western boundary. We can expect a coastal upwelling, wind-induced coastal upwelling, 
on the eastern part of the ocean and like California, well-known Canary, upwelling and some other upwellings <coughs> in the world. But we are in not a favorable for upwellings uh, part of the ocean. We are in the western boundary current, Gulf Stream, Florida current. Uh, unless we have hurricane, because the uh, weight uh, in the western boundary current with stress is important because it's small compared to other components. As soon as we have hurricane, could you wind uh, stress increasing quadratical to wind, also drug coefficient is now well known increasing maybe for factor two or three. So we easily get like four category one maybe increase by 50 times if normal condition we assume like seven meters per second average for category 200 plus times. So it's huge interest of wind stress. And of course it's that dominating parameter and it must cause upwelling, but also requirement that it should be in right direction along the coast. In the wrong direction, it will produce downwelling. So let's uh, look at uh, two cases. First, of course, very well known, famous, maybe a non-famous case of Wilma, which produced some troubles for South Florida. It uh, started, uh, uh, it actually um, was category five at uh, Yucatan Peninsula for a few days, was not moving, and then started moving northeast uh, and across uh, Florida at some point. It crossed uh, Florida at category two, approximately, near Orlando somewhere, center. Yeah, we can see here on the radar image how this was happening. And uh, what is important uh, here, that when it was coming and crossing southeast Florida, was component uh, going uh, up north, that's favorable for appearing. That was, I think, huge, maybe 100 times bigger than normally. And we have, like we have here, that four of Miami and the BC meteorological station which showed that at the maximum was 45.5 meters per second. This is category two hurricane. It was also 163 its uh, direction, so it moving almost from south. So it was a favorable component of wind stress during this case, and that should produce a villain. Yeah, how we know that it did that? We have. Uh, uh, I disappear Muri with 11 meter rise of us on the bottom looking up and John of course remembers it was still that famous SFOMC late 1990s and we still keep it, keep it for 25 years uh, and uh, actually we registered all hurricanes which came through or nearby uh, I don't know why we are doing that but I thought that it's good to have long term observational data set yeah and that mooring showed a uh, quite interesting picture. On the top, this is acoustic reflection, uh, echo intensity, and you can see here that uh, this is C surface, that uh, kind of orange uh, color that's changing with this type. And then suddenly this event, uh, this is when uh, Vilma was crossing southeast Florida shelf at our location. And uh, what happened next? We, ha we also have, of course, from ADCP records, uh, time records around that time, and also temperature records. And what's interesting is to look at the vertical profiles. Let's look at that uh, red-brown color, and uh, you look at the, this is zero. You look uh, near the surface, uh, water is moving in the east direction, which means that it's going away. And bottom, yeah, it's moving in. That's classical wind-driven feeling. And the uh, temperature responded quite significantly. It dropped uh, from uh, 28 to 24, or centigrade, within uh, just, I believe, a few hours. And those profiles uh, are taken uh, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, soon, and it started uh, appearing. We decided, let's look what is the profile here. Uh, so that's a classical kind of winter driven upwelling and it's here only because we have hurricane, huge increase of uh, wind stress. So it's probably obvious, must be. And it's 2005, we had uh, a few other cases, of course, and one was, uh, uh, I'm moving one direction, yeah, one was 
Hurricane Irma, it was kind of famous here with much attention because that damaged corals by waves, I guess, wave breaking mostly, not by, as we see now, probably not by temperature, but anyway. So this is the case when it was maximum speed on our side. Speed was maximum 35.4 meters per second field gust, of course. And this is category one storm. And also it was on the western side of Florida. It was moving along. And we had a long exposure to this type of hurricane wind on the east coast than for Wilma. So it was less intense hurricane, but seems to be produced more aquatically and because more time it was affected. Mm. Yeah, that's what we saw during uh, Hurricane Irma, 2017. Echo intensity uh, is obvious here. And it's why the time range, because it was sliding to west of Florida. And uh, that also produced uh, quite a characteristic uh, vertical velocity profile, so you see head zero and uh, this uh, red-brown uh, curve uh, is eastward velocity component, so top uh, layers moving east, yeah. bottom layers moving west, that's a feeling. And if you look at uh, uh, <coughs> temperature, it dropped even more by 6 centigrade, uh, uh, because probably was longer exposure, though hurricane was less intensity. How dangerous for corals? Uh, we didn't see really any danger from the point of view of temperature in this case. Not like in that 2010 winter time when temperature dropped below 16 during upwelling. Not hurricane, of course, related. Here was dropping to 24, probably nothing. So main damage, uh, I believe, that time uh, was due to wind, wind waves, breaking waves and destroying uh, corals. So how important uh, these uh, uh, situations with the feeling produced by hurricane? Uh, I'm not sure, since uh, it's not very often happens, not even every year. We have hurricane here intense, and also it must be on Florida side, uh, I mean on east, west Florida side, not on our side. Uh, next, uh, uh, we can look at the uh, appearing produced by breaking internal wave uh, solitones. Uh, I take some water. Mm -hmm. uh, this is well-known situation on Conch Reef, for example, which is in Keys. And this type of uh, uh, internal wave solitones comes uh, very often, sometimes uh, twice per day with uh, similar tide. And uh, uh, Megan Miller, our a student, a master degree student, she created a model, computational fluid dynamics model for internal wave solitone breaking on the conch reef. So this actually includes a real bathymetry, and now we can see how solitone is breaking on this structure. Yeah. This is soliton is coming. Soliton is a group of um, internal waves. Typically it's three or four, but sometimes can be more, or sometimes just one. In this case it's three, and the force is a little, little bit weak. So these internal wave solitons, uh, they are reaching this slope, and then pretty much they crash on the slope, but this slope is full of corals, of course, and uh, uh, how it's affected. We can look at the same simulation from little bit different angle. Yeah, this is the same simulation, but in this case we have uh, uh, this uh, red, this is a plane, which is uh, parallel to that continental slope. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, soliton is coming from below, and you see when it comes, it produces lots of uh, turbulence, mixing. And then for the next uh, 12 hours, it's quite you know, like a little, uh, little waves. What's happening, it's uh, uh, developing between the uh, warm and uh, cold temperatures on the thermocline, and when it crashes, it produces mixture of cold and warm, and the signature on the bottom. Yeah, in order to really catch uh, 
all details. At this point, we cannot catch uh, separate corals, and the reason that not the model, because we need data, and this standard GIS data, they have resolution few meters, so that's what we did uh, with that, but we did very fine mesh, and that's uh, that result of that model, still image, uh, it's uh, showing signature of this uh, crashed internal wave soliton, this is temperatures, temperatures mostly between 24 and uh, 26 here, so it's kind of mysterious number, 24, we always see in the sub 24, so it's not, not uh, dangerous, uh, I believe, for corals, but uh, of course it's a significant impact uh, in terms of turbulence uh, by turbation, and this area actually very well known, uh, Scripps, uh, Folks, uh, Leiter and colleagues, uh, uh, Leiter, he was here, I believe, uh, about 15 years ago, giving seminar at this, maybe at this auditorium even, about his study of Concha Reef. They did a very detailed study of the velocity field uh, during this crash, internal wave, solitons, uh, and also temperature. And also, Steve Miller from uh, Nova Oceanographic Center was part of uh, the study. They published several papers and they have very good qualitative, quantitative data. But what we claim here, uh, qualitative analysis, in order to produce exactly what we have exactly measured what is internal initial conditions at the beginning, all that. We just took some average here based on that work of uh, and his colleagues. So what's happening when solitons crash on the conch reef? How important is this? For conch reef, I believe it is. But uh, solitons uh, actually been hunting on other, other projects for internal waste. Solitons in Straits of Florida, here in Fort Lauderdale, Miami area, already in the, uh, not in coastal area, but in general. And we see not that often, maybe on average one good soliton per month. And we still don't know why they are maybe interacting with Miami Terrace, so uh, difficult to say. Uh, uh, that is uh, much less uh, intensity and how far they propagate in, in our place, uh, in our show, we still don't know. Not yet run the model, but it uh, might be next uh, step. But contrary in some way unique because of very strong internal wave soliton activity, probably some kind of bottom topography. We don't know. We know that they are intense and they are coming. They have been studied in detail. Now we have model. And then we uh, go to a pairing produced by an undercurrent jet. First, what is undercurrent jet? Yeah, Chris Mango, he was our previous student 10 years ago. Maybe he remembers that. Oh, you probably part of that uh, publication. Uh, yeah, yeah. Person. Uh, yeah, so we were hired in 2005-2006 for four-year project uh, uh, in order to provide uh, environmental and oceanographic conditions at the place where uh, one of the Houston companies wanted uh, to build a liquid nature gas port. It was supposed to be in latitude of Pompano and uh, eight miles offshore on Miami Terrace. Uh, we were happy to start that project that was yeah, quite interesting people from Houston came. Yeah, later what happened, uh, that project was uh, prohibited by the governor Chris, of, governor Chris of Florida because they were concerned that it may explode and terrorists may explode. It was 2005, 2006, and they yeah, finished it. But they were finding us for four years. It was amazing, how can it be? But anyway, for these four years, uh, we've been uh, doing uh, mostly uh, environmental measurements uh, and also deployed uh, a DCP mooring at 250 meters looking up and it was uh, providing data almost continuously we just sometimes had to go and to change batteries for four years 2006-2010 uh, but at the beginning of project uh, we hired uh, uh, Walton Smith and I knew that it's super ship with so equipment uh, and I knew that it can measure profiles when it's moving, and I uh, convinced the captain to make a transect, cross-shelf transects from the Ole Beach to that eight miles offshore location. 
it was not easy to convince him because he said, oh, you get on these corals, damaged corals, you damage ship. You have, of course, all this equipment. Yeah, taps. And, uh, so finally he agreed, and that was actually interesting uh, result after that. So we were coming for one year, every two months uh, to that location, and uh, at the beginning we were doing this transit. It was supposed to be option, not, uh, but we decided to do it. And what we found uh, was a little bit uh, strange. Uh, so when we look at, uh, it's one of the transits on April 5th, current speed, and uh, there is scale there showing uh, direct, uh, directions, it's magnitude actually, magnitude, coral speed, coral speed, current speed. <laughs> but uh, when we look at uh, current direction, that was interesting. This uh, more reddish color is direction up north. This green is direction south. So what we see on that transect, there is something like a jet attached to the continental slope and moving south. Yeah, then we were continuing this uh, for full year, every two months, and we saw it on all of those. But what was interesting that it was different uh, summer and uh, winter. It was seasonal cycle. A little bit later, we now figure out what is going on. So during uh, summer time, we saw it as counter current. But like here. During winter time, it was pushed on the surface and produced surface. This is undercurrent produced surface, uh, counter current. What's the axis on the, what's the scale? Mm -hmm. uh, this is eight miles. Here, this is in time, uh, but that's what the uh, ship was moving. I say 10 knots, uh, probably that. Homogeneous. So that's the eight miles. So this is uh, about four miles, maybe. And this jet was actually changing all the time. We saw a different shape, different height, a little bit. And again, it was clearly cycle, seasonal cycle. Winter time, it's uh, undercurrent. Winter, summer time, undercurrent, and winter time, countercurrent. So based on that, we actually uh, well, yeah, decided uh, to publish this because it was kind of unusual. Of course, uh, undercurrent observed in states of Florida by University of Miami folks maybe 40, 50 years ago. It's not a surprise, but that was in the central or in the eastern part. But uh, never anyone seen something attached to the continental slope. And that's what is we found. So that's a concept which we produced at that time. We had some different hypotheses what is happening, why we have this jet. And uh, what we have here, uh, that uh, there is a Florida current, it's a major current, one, two meters per second. And then there is Southfield current, which is about order of magnitude less. Also, it's not stable, it's going up and down. Yeah, also Gulf Stream, of course, also going meandering. And uh, it was uh, not continuous. We saw it, then it disappearing for a while. Maybe it was going again of our range of equipment somewhere. But when we averaged for one month, it was clearly the southward floor, which is about order of magnitude less on average than Gulf Stream. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. What's next uh, happened? Uh, next, uh, we actually we published in 2017, but around 2018, we got gliders. We get gliders. This is new technology which allows to actually do much uh, uh, fine resolution measurements. Uh, and uh, what was important uh, by that time, uh, Teledyne produced Flocum G3. Previous was it, I think, G2, which uh, didn't have propulsion system, didn't have propeller, so it was useless in strong currents like uh, Gulf Stream. Uh, but this had propeller. And uh, this propeller propulsion system was much easier to navigate in Gulf Stream. I, I wouldn't say that the 100% can navigate, <laughs> uh, but in many cases we are. When we go like two and a half meters per second Gulf Stream, of course, yeah, we cannot do much. We just go either to coastal area or dive below Gulf Stream. Yeah, one of the dives below Gulf Stream ended um, very strange on it disappeared and we never see it. <laughs> Yeah, our university has insurance policy and they gave us money, we bought another one. Now we are more careful, trying not to go. 
bilo vel streamer, ima vod iz dnea, ponovis. And also we implemented so-called LADCP approach. LADCP allows to do measurements of current velocities from moving object, because normally you have to fix it on the bottom and then, but this allows, that was actually given to us by Andreas Kern, that's his name, in Columbia University. And we implemented that we got gliders which can go almost anywhere in the states of Florida and they produce uh, every few minutes vertical uh, profile. Not few minutes more because it has whole down, up, down and up you know, to produce it, but anyway, we were producing uh, temperatures, and line, conductivity, the just CTD, and then uh, producing optical characteristics, three optical channels, and velocity, all three components. So that was, Great instrument to be. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's just deployment from small boat. This instrument can be used from small boat. In even a little bit smart, can do some own decisions, but typically you have to override those when the surfaces and we have connection to uh, satellite. Yeah, so that uh, was beginning of a new experiment. Uh, we were just learning, studying how to do it, losing glider and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, sometime 2022 we were able to start really systematic measurements. And uh, we also used, uh, in addition to gliders, uh, so-called wire worker. This is instrument uh, developed uh, uh, by Rob Pinkel at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Oceanography, which is driven by energy of surface waves, moving up and down, and there is one-way lock, which is moving this instrument to the bottom, and then it hits some button and releases and goes freely. It's important, it's free without any distortions by waves, and then continue that cycle almost indefinitely. It's driven by energy of uh, surface wave, that's probably why it looks so green, this picture. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we used uh, two instruments. Uh, that uh, wire worker was deployed uh, at 100 meter isobat, a little, little bit uh, up north from Port Everglades, up north of Anchorage, and we were starting uh, transacts uh, by glider from that location. First it was to compare what we see on both instruments. Yeah, this is just one inter comparison at the beginning of glider uh, mission. Uh, this uh, shows glider and wire worker. First, it's uh, CTD measurements. They are reasonably good. And taking it account that it's not always easy to keep a, a glider around because all these edges come in a little bit uh, later about edges. Uh, but was sometimes distance up to half a mile. Uh, so, I think reasonable coincidence. It has even a uh, good consistency for velocity profile. You see here east, velocity east, and uh, velocity north. When we look at velocity north, you see current uh, that's about uh, one knot, because we are not uh, far away still from the coast. When we go down, uh, it's negative. Wow, looks like it's signature of appearing. Yeah, when we look here, uh, we Oh, that is signature that it's on the current, but here, negative means that it's signature probably of that value. So what's going on here? Yeah, so we did uh, different uh, types of trajectories, snake-like, just going along the coast. Or, and here by color we can see most of the velocity component. Also there are vectors which are produced automatically by the system from 20 meter depths when uh, glider is 20 meters, it produced this uh, recording that vectors of uh, current velocity. We also, for fun, decided to do loop type of trajectories, like here, starting somewhere here, going one loop, it was trying to do second loop, and something happened, we had to take it out. When we did these loops, I guess it's very interesting thing. Yeah, this is uh, that loop and that 20 meter vector symbol. 
Ну, detail. Она не выходит с верхнем стешке. Это зум и мо. Я объясню, что это не выглядит как there is eddy, because the vector is changing direction. And between this was a few hours, uh, between this loop of transacts, and then during that time it will start changing. What is that? Sounds like it's eddy. And uh, yeah, Dr. Deutsch, uh, even uh, before we published that, that Dixie Recipe paper, said that it's probably this undercurrent connected to edges. We had no way to disapprove or prove that hypothesis, but now sounds we see that. So what might be happening, that uh, share between undercurrent and uh, lower the current quite significant in developing eddy, and then edges start kind of inertia system, it start contributing to the cost of component currents in the direction south, because it's uh, cyclonic edges. And uh, in most cases, uh, when uh, that was done by uh, student uh, Alfredo Cuizada, he says that in most cases he see connection between uh, edges and uh, this undercurrent going south. Mm, maybe that's interesting too. Edges, of course, are well known as now. Yeah, Dr. Shea with his colleagues, uh, Brian House also was is still involved, of course, in study with very high frequency radar. That's one of the publications. I think after s form c that experiment with John was part of that. And you can see here what's happening as for that paper. First, uh, we have a reasonably uh, nice picture, no turbulence, and then start disturbance. This disturbance is becoming more and more like any file is quite nice. Eddy here, Eddy then disappears. And that was happening within like three days. That was typically scale and was consistent what we were observing uh, with uh, gliders. So this is a situation when uh, edges, some middle scale edges seems to be connected uh, to that undercurrent. So they are coupled maybe. And we cannot say even uh, which is primary and which is <laughs> Second day, it's like exit chicken and eggs because uh, edges starting started uh, by the shear and then it's contribute continue contributing to the undercurrent. Yeah, that's we just uh, that's results maybe half a year old. We still think about this. We have to publish a corner. And uh, but it, then one interesting conclusion. I asked uh, uh, Alfredo Cuisada to plot uh, average uh, uh, data on this plot. Vertical axis, that's east velocity, and zero is here. And uh, horizontal component is north velocity, zero is here. After this averaging for one year, what we see, what we see uh, when uh, North velocity is positive, that's mean it's not undercurrent, that just regular remains of Gulf Stream, probably the coastal area. Uh, also, east component going east. Uh, velocity going east. But when we have uh, negative that undercurrent, east velocity becomes, as the current is near the bottom, uh, becomes uh, western. So this means that uh, these uh, structures on the current and uh, sub scale edges may be contributing or maybe main source of upwelling on the southeast of Florida coast. Because edges observed uh, very often here, it's no sub scale edges. Uh, and um, maybe that's the main mechanism which uh, produces upwellings. Uh, and uh, what do upwellings? Uh, we saw that case from January, but they do sometimes lots of troubles in, even uh, during summer time. This is our uh, measurements uh, in uh, of June 10, 15. I think glider was moving along the shore. shore just uh, this is the uh, first is north velocity. So we see yellow, it will be reddish. Uh, that is uh, north was component velocity up to 1.2 meter per second, maybe. But blue, dark blue, this is negative when we see this undercurrent. 
That's in June. Uh, in order to be able to see more clearly, we just put direction. So on the top, moving north, approximately as supposed to be. This flow uh, current, the bottom is definitely going south. And then we look at temperature. Uh, temperature, 100 meters, drops below 16 centigrade, uh, which uh, survival level for coral reefs. But what's happening, because when this uh, uh, undercurrent jet takes place, this eddies, it produces movement of water appearing, and of course, it's not doing this water during summertime because it's mixing when it's going up. But uh, that might be the major source of appearance here. It affects not only corals, like uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, Rivera Beach uh, local TV stations reported on June 21 that uh, due to upwelling of fish was uh, stunned and uh, moved to the, it turned out to be on the beach and died because it lost uh, consciousness and by waves were you know, brought on the beach uh, and that's uh, just fish uh, which we even ran away but couldn't but corals probably affected. Uh, and they might also think now, uh, we have uh, coral, intense coral reefs up north, uh, West Palm Beach, and th then between West Palm Beach and Jupiter, uh, corals are disappearing pretty much. And so uh, uh, we haven't yet yet beyond uh, Jupiter, but there are reports of divers, numerous reports, uh, that there are more intense upwellings uh, north of uh, Jupiter and that might be reason why we don't have corals anymore, because they are affected strongly by upbearings, and they stop somewhere between West Palm Beach and uh, Jupiter. Yeah. So that's the <coughs> conclusions. We have uh, observed the prominent upwelling events uh, on the southeast Florida shelf under hurricane conditions. Internal wave solitons breaking on the continental shelf uh, can cause upwelling events too. And recently been uh, modeled uh, this computational fluid dynamics uh, in our lab. And uh, most interesting conclusion, a year long series of glider transects on the southeast uh, Florida shelf between Fort Lauderdale and uh, Jupiter has revealed the previously, previously unknown upwelling mechanism associated with the southward floor attached to the continental slope and influenced by or coupled with sub scale edges. Yeah, we acknowledge uh, funding agency of this naval research and uh, also South Florida Ocean Measurement Facilities they allowed us and uh, coordinated in some way our experiments and also the St. Andreas Kernhev from Columbia University uh, for his uh, first he provided us with that LADCP technology and also provided important uh, comments uh, also thank uh, our lab members uh, pretty much all our all lab participated in this project, it was teamwork just we have few authors who were analyzing mostly data but folks uh, were preparing gliders, deploying gliders and also finding them which was important <laughs> yeah of course they all time on satellite communication just have proper weather to get their own small boat you know, and uh, get them uh, so that's a uh, situation that we had 10 members lab but now five people graduated unfortunately they, fortunately for them they graduated all same year same time so now I have to find uh, other yeah, students or just the people who can help uh, on the continuation of this <coughs> project. Yeah, that's, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, questions from the people in the room? Payson? Hi, Alex. Uh, great talk. I was wondering the Florida undercurrent consider that, I know it's previously unknown, but would you consider that to be just a local thing or is it actually in the wider range a part of the AMOC that goes back? I don't know. Uh, about a couple of years ago I get an email from Brazil. 
they were concerned after our publication in Deep Sea Research, do they have also undercurrents there? I told them just invite us and we'll come with us. Yeah. Um, I, I saw you, you presented the um, hurricane data, you know, extreme wind event causing the upwelling, and that mm -hmm. made it all the way up to 11 meters, which is pretty extreme for the, you know, upwelling to reach that far up the shelf. I'm curious if you looked at any of the upwelling events that were less intense with the gliders, if you looked at any wind direction data during that to see if there was any correlation? Uh, wind uh, direction, uh, yeah, unfortunately that uh, for a rock and DBC station uh, now uh, in repairs for the last probably one year, so it's uh, more difficult to get a uh, direction of uh, wind. Yeah, so we don't uh, have systematic observations of wind. There are lots of questions still here. Just yeah, there, there. If you look at some of Tom Lee's old data, there's probably upwelling associated with the meandering. As you pointed out, that was the one mechanism you didn't really um, present. Yeah, we uh, didn't yeah. have data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was by a few miles uh, offshore. Yeah, that's a possible mechanism. Maybe some other mechanism which we just don't know. But uh, that uh, may the same effect uh, from this bigger edges which produce maybe also meandering. They also produce this anti yeah, you cyclonic to, uh, component. You often end up with an inshore countercurrent that comes all the way up to the surface. Yeah, yeah, during uh, one time. sailing races by avoiding that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, uh, we see it uh, during winter time. More typical, uh, it's on the surface, uh, and uh, we even were thinking, uh, okay, so that's uh, this uh, undercurrent is going to Hollywood outfall, and uh, it's going south to Miami Beach. Yeah. That's uh, probably more expensive for mentions are in West Palm Beach. Because uh, uh, this developer empirically probably found so that the closures of the beach are not so often in West Palm Beach compared to in Miami Beach. It's my wild hypothesis. I see questions in Zoom from Arthur Mariano and Lef Looney. Maybe Arthur can begin. A uh, nice seminar. Thank you for uh, stopping by. Stop by more often. I'm wondering, have you seen that result of the undercurrent interacting with the sub-mesoscale eddies in any numerical simulations? There's a lot of numerical simulations of this area. Yeah, we would love to implement one of the numerical simulations, but haven't yet done. We did uh, that uh, for breaking it all way solitons, uh, and uh, uh, it's logistical. No, I mean, but uh, we yeah, haven't I yet... Uh, like, yeah. yeah, I say more like... You don't have to implement it. There's a lot of numerical simulations out there. I wonder if you could, you know, get some data from the modelers and, and see if you see this phenomena or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one well, uh, situation here that uh, most of our models are hydrostatic, and uh, we are probably requiring uh, here non-hydrostatic model. We are using computation fluid dynamics ANSYS fluent, but that is. Uh, not implemented for this type of uh, size of objects uh, like co uh, western boundary current. I remember uh, was uh, Professor Moore here and we were trying to implement uh, for South Florida shelf but, uh, model, but it was uh, five kilometer horizontal resolution. Of course, we cannot see much and it was uh, hydrostatic. So that's required new generation of models. I believe they exist, uh, just we haven't yet get to that scale. We are working mostly on a hurricane RC interface with this type of models, millimeter scales, but going to kilometers, that's already different. Yeah, we would love to have, but just trying to find opportunity to cooperate with someone and uh, do it. Thank you. Yes, Looney. Can you hear me okay, hopefully so. Yes, yes. Um, I Excellent presentation. I stepped away at the beginning for a second, so I'm sorry if you've answered. I have two quick questions. Sorry if you answered the first one. I guess the first is, have you looked at the West Florida coast to see if similar storms that are causing the upwelling along the east uh, would be causing similar upwelling at the west because you have the opposite wind and you have the opposite 
I guess, meaning we went to get that welling even though they're still swider. And then the second question would be is with new technology, have you looked at any of the new technologies to, to see if you can see similar results? I'm just thinking of sail drones have the ADCP current measurements granted only down to 80 meters to see if you can see similar things along the east coast. Well, yeah, yeah, of course, uh, yeah, we are trying to also implement that uh, sail drones, uh, but they somehow not possible <laughs> to rent from them. They now so big demand uh, that uh, we are somewhere in line at who knows when we get uh, those. Uh, about the west uh, coast of Florida, yes, of course, they have uh, upvalued lands. Uh, and during that Irma, which I mentioned uh, for East Florida shelf, uh, it produced lots of trouble uh, on the West Florida shelf, what happened just water get away and was uh, was uh, just uh, made bottom with all this fish diving for some time. And uh, here upwelling didn't uh, happen uh, really because upwelling events also depend on the shape uh, of uh, bottom topography in the shelf area. That was very shallow kind of uh, area and water get away, but it was no chance that it come come back from deep because it was very shallow. Yeah. I think I said Excellent. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that, that answered it perfectly. And I guess one other quick thing um, is with the, the sail drone stuff, if you ever have any ideas, uh, I will put my email in the chat, but I work with the, the sail drone hurricane project, so oh, yeah, we're always down to, to try new things and, and position them in areas to test new stuff. So. Yeah, that's a fantastic application for hurricanes, of course. Uh, I saw this uh, data with very high uh, resolution photography of uh, sea surface during hurricane conditions. It gives much, much information which was not available before about small scale physics when I see interface. Yeah, thank you. That would be great if you ever be able to get the sail drones to rent them. Uh, yeah. yes. uh, do you know why the... Uh Welling was so uh, came so high to the surface compared to being normally isn't like isn't it like at two hundred meters versus being higher at a like uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, depends on situation some of buildings of course probably many of known they come to the surface uh, and they produce some kind of frontal line between cold water brought from below and warm remaining water, it may be 10, 20, sometimes 100 kilometers, uh, this uh, uh, front, uh, so it, uh, but there are also internal, which never get to the surface. In our case, uh, I forgot to mention this physics here, probably very simple. During summer time, there is strong stratification density, they cannot get it. Uh, winter time is mixing up and they easily pushed uh, by Coriolis force. Coriolis force is doing that, it's uh, just working to the right and moving this jet to the surface. Yeah, we saw uh, also uh, during uh, summertime uh, countercurrent, surface countercurrent, but more often undercurrent. Also during winter time, we also saw sometimes it depends on local stratification and also force of this uh, jet. We uh, still have to quantify it, <laughs> see it uh, qualitatively what's going on. I believe this is probably true, but uh, we need modeling, <laughs> of course, serious modeling. Okay, I don't see any further questions, and thank you again thank you for, for coming and giving an interesting presentation. Thank you all for coming. We won't have a seminar on Friday because it's a recruitment Friday, and on next Wednesday we have someone who is a visitor at NOAA. I forgot his name, but uh, uh, I hope uh, you will see the announcement in the email and he will come. Uh, I think that will be another interesting talk. So that's all. Uh, thank you for coming to Congress. Yeah, this, this is a good ending for the video. <coughs>